And those were, those were ordered, you know, D5 and a half to 75 or something like that. They don't always say continuous infusion, sometimes they do. But if you get IV fluid, uh, you know, what's well, obviously an IV fluid to run at some hourly rate without anything else, then that's what it's talking about. So um, this is more about the task or manipulating it. So we're going to assume that I have verified my order and I've got the right patient and the right drug and all that, okay? So without skipping over that, um, I want to acknowledge it. So I go to the OmniCell and I get my fluids. I just have here a bag of 0.9 normal saline. So I'm taking that to the room. I'm taking some primary fluid to the room. And what else will I need? Flushes. Flushes, Flushes that's right. Alcohol. And some alcohol wipes. And I'll need an arm. Michelle, are those IV arms back there? Will you bring me one, please? Alfredo, will you look over there and bring me a flush? Um, Michelle, in, in a wire cart back there, there should also be some alcohol swabs, Michelle. I think anyone, Dad, that'll work. And so just bring me a flush and a couple alcohol swabs. We'll go ahead and do the whole thing and say we did it right. Okay, so I go in the room and I've spoken to the patient and I've identified them appropriately and all that good stuff. Now I'm actually ready to hang it, okay? All right, so I've ordered my IV pump and I've called back to ask them why my IV pump is not here and then they brought up my IV pump and I, had, I, I went out of the unit and over to the supply elevator and got my IV pump. I got me some flushes and I got me an arm with an IV. All right, so I'll take my fluid and take it out of its outer bag. Sometimes the outer bag will have a little condensation on the inside. That's okay. As long as your, as long as your bag itself is not leaking. Primary IV tube. It's got a little perforation there. And barring something unforeseen, everyone will have a new piece of tubing to use for your checkoff. As long as our supply people come through for us, we should have them. All right, so I open up my IV tubing. First thing I'm going to do when I open up my IV tubing is roll the clamp closed. Very first thing. Otherwise, I'm going to spike the bag and the fluid's going to start running and my drip chamber's not full and I'm going to have a bunch of air in the tubing. So you take your bag, your, your tubing out of the bag and the first thing you do is roll off the clamp. Next, I'm going to take off my two little pieces of paper. Those are going to go in the trash. And I'm going to take off the blue spine that protects the drip chamber portion. So all that stuff gets discarded. <clears throat> now, I have my tubing. And I'll uncoil this end so it's not twisted. And so now i got my tubing. And i got the spike in one hand. And I've got the clamp in the other hand. Along with the end of the tubing. Now all this stays up in the air. You can't prime your tubing in a trash can. That's a big no-no. Stay away from the sink or the trash can or the cup that's sitting on your patient's bedside table. You don't need any of that stuff to prime tubing. You can prime tubing without wasting any of your fluid, this new tubing. I know some of you have trouble with the used tubing, but that's because this stuff costs seven bucks a piece. And so, we, we, you know, just out of feasibility, we have to reuse it. But with new tubing, you don't have to do that. So stay away from the sink and the trash can and the cold cup of coffee on the bedside table. All right, so I got all this done. I still got my cover on it. Now I'm gonna spike my bag. Take my cap off of here. Take my spike off, being careful not to touch it. And then I spike the bag, and as soon as I spike the bag, I hang it up and get it out of my hands. All right, so my bag is spiked. I don't have to worry about it running because I closed off my clamp. And I'm going to immediately hang it up on my IV pole and get it out of my hands. Now I'm going to get my drip chamber and get it half to two-thirds full. Got it? Half to two-thirds full. If you can't see it, trust me. And then I'll hold my <coughs> IV tubing like this. In my dominant hand, I'll have my clamp, which is still closed. And in my other hand, I'll have the end of the tubing. And ultimately, this is what I'm going to be looking for. Because when my fluid gets to here is when I want to stop it. Now what I'm going to do here is slowly open the clamp and I'll watch my drip chamber to make sure it's dripping. Once it starts dripping, I'll watch it go through. I always keep this drip chamber portion inverted to encourage air bubbles to get out of it. If you keep it down like this, air bubbles are more likely to stay in the drip chamber portion 
and you're more likely to get those aggravating air in line alarms. So keep it inverted. Another thing I'll do is I'm priming the tubing and I got it open. I'll thump the drip chamber portion up against the pump to encourage any tiny little air bubbles to get out of this drip chamber portion. Can everybody see that? Is what I'm saying make sense? What did you thump against the pen? Yeah, just thump it up against there to just to agitate the bubbles out of the drip chamber portion. All right, so now I'm going to open it up. And the fluid's starting to go. And as it comes through the drip, drip chamber portion, I'll thump the air out. Now, the lower I hold it, the faster it'll go. If I hold it up here, it won't prime at all because this is above the bag. So you can actually use this as a governor to slow down your rate of flow as you get near the end along with your clamp. So I got a good quick drip going. And now I need to find the end of my fluid and I'm watching it come up. And so as it gets to the end, I close the clamp. So now I am primed to the end of my tubing. I haven't dripped any fluid out all over the place. I stayed away from the trash can and the sink. And I'm nicely primed to the end of my tubing. Now, somebody point out what sound we have not had to hear yet. Beeping. Right. Why is it not beeping? <laughs> exactly. Um, folks with uh, not a lot of experience with the pumps, when you tend to go to the pump to do this kind of thing, um, people just tend to want to turn the pump on. Leave the pump off. We don't need the pump yet. Leave the pump off until you're ready to prime it and hit the go button. Okay? So we're still not ready to touch the pump. I just want to point that out because I know you guys get a lot of beeping when you're working with this and it, it, it kind of gets you flustered. You have to stop what you're doing and find the silence button and all that. And then when you hit the silence button, you know you've only got so long. And so, you, you, know, you, you know, just leave the pump off. You don't need the pump yet. All right, so now i got prime tubing. Now I'm going to take my alcohol swab and my flush. My flush comes in a little, you know, clear plastic bag. I tear that off and I leave that over here. And now I'm going to come over here and flush my IV line. So I'll swab it for how long? Okay. I'll swab it 15 seconds and so now i got a clean port. I'll come back to the port in a second. Now, flushes. Now these, this one's probably been refilled for reuse. But you all know when these flushes first come, they have a little air bubble in them, don't they? Yeah. All new flushes have a little air bubble in them. And so what I see people doing is you come and you swab your port, <clears throat> and then you take your cap off and turn around and get rid of your air bubble. When you take your eye off your port, you can't assume it's clean anymore. That goes with anything that's sterile or that you have sanitized for any reason. When you take your eyes off, you don't know if something's touched it. Commonly, the patient's gown will touch it. Who wants to take their patient's gown off and put it on themselves? Nobody. So you certainly don't want to put that in anybody's body. So what I recommend you do is just leave the air bubble in there. As long as you have it somewhat inverted, the air bubble will be up at the top and won't go in. If you do push the air bubble in, it's not going to hurt them. They're not going to die from an air embolus. It's a tiny little bit of air. But you don't want to push it in, especially if your patient or their family's watching, because not a lot of people know that. And they all watch those TV shows where people die from the little bit of air injected, even though that doesn't actually happen. So don't do it because, you know, it can cause some distress among your patient or your family. So avoid doing it. But you don't have to get that air bubble out as long as you got your flush inverted just a little bit. And almost all IVs will give you the opportunity to do that. Yes? I couldn't hear you. Okay. The air bubble, as long as it doesn't go in the IV, is not going to hurt anybody. If it does go in, it's not going to hurt anybody, but it doesn't always look good for the patients. I say just leave the air bubble in there. Just do it inverted. You're not going to be squirting saline on your patient this way. You're not going to be taking your eye off your port. You can keep your eye on your port, and you're not going to make a mess if you just leave it there. If you do want to get rid of it, that's not necessarily wrong, but just be mindful of what you get into when you do that, okay? You should get rid of that. See, here's the problem with it, as far as I see it. To get the air bubble out, you got to take this off, the cap, if you can't see it. The cap should stay on everything until the moment you're going to connect it. Because as soon as you take the cap off, you're exposing this to the environment. 
And the longer it stays exposed to the environment, the more likely it's going to pick up a contaminant, and then the more likely that contaminant is going to get in their bloodstream. Okay? So if you did take this off, turn and get your air bubble out, and then turn around and clean, then you're moving this exposed flush around while you're swabbing the port, or else you have to put the cap back on, which means you have to make sure your dirty little fingers don't touch it. I think that's all complicated. Just leave the air bubble in there and just don't inject it, okay? What you're saying is our patients are more likely to die of a hospital-acquired infection than the air bubble in our port. Exactly. Right, because the chance of them dying from the air is zero. Okay. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> yeah, um, so healthcare-acquired infections sure. and line-associated bloodstream infections are a serious problem, and the more we can do to uh, cut that down, the better. Y'all mind if we get some fresh air? Is that okay if we open the window? Stephen, would you open those windows? Would you open those windows back there, please? So are you wearing gloves for this or not? It's not necessary to wear gloves for this. When do you wear gloves? Or actually, actually, let's look. Why do you wear gloves? To protect yourself. To protect yourself. That's right. So if there's a reasonable chance that you're going to come into contact with some patient's bodily fluids, wear gloves, a dress and change or something like that. Doing this, it is not necessary to wear gloves. You do have to wash your hands, of course, but it's not necessary to wear gloves. Okay, we're back to our prime tubing, which still has its cap on the end. We still have a nice quiet IV pump, and we have our new flush. So I have swabbed this port for 15 seconds, and I've got the IV line in my left hand, and I've got the flush in my right hand. And so I've cleaned it, and I'm gonna take the cap off, connect the flush, and I'm gonna flush the line. Open the clamp if necessary. Okay, so I flush the line. I take the flush off. Flushes are single use only. They're not single use except when. They're just single use only. So once you disconnect the flush from whatever you're using it on, then don't ever use it again. So you can't put it down and then push your Lasix over four minutes and then pick the same one up and use it again. So it's gotten dirty in that four minutes, I guarantee you. So if you need to do, if you need to give a drug like that, then how many flushes do you need? Two. Yeah, just bring two flushes. Do you want us to aspirate? Of course, you can aspirate. You don't always get blood on a peripheral lines after it's been in a while, and that's not necessarily an indication not to use it. But it is a good idea to aspirate. They do kind of help with patency a little bit, and they can tell you whether or not you can get blood out of line in case you have to get a lap. So I flush the line. After I flush the line... I'm going to swab again for how long? Right, because you swab before every access. And I'm keeping my eyes on this. It's all right in front of me. And then I'm going to connect my IV. So now my IV tubing is connected to the patient's IV port. If you can't see that. So I have prime tubing. I haven't put it in the pump yet, but it's connected to the patient. That's fine, because remember, the first thing I did when I opened this up well, let's close off the clamp, so nothing's going to flow, right? All right. Now we can start to turn our attention to the pump, but we're not going to turn it on. So I'm going to put my tubing in the pump. Just start at the bottom and slide this blue piece in, and then push the bottom in. You don't open this first. You just leave that alone. You know, this little blue and white piece will open and close. When it's open like this, that means it's clamped. When it's closed, which is the way it comes new, that means it's open. That's why you have to initially close this one. So just leave that alone. The pump will control this for you. So I put this in the pump, press the door close and close that. As soon as I do that, I open up the clamp. I open up the clamp now for two reasons. Number one, the pump now controls the flow. Number two, if I don't do it now, I'm going to forget. And I'm going to hit start and leave the room, and as soon as I get out of the room, which is probably going to be an isolation room, I'm going to get an occluded alarm. <laughs> That's how that works, isn't it? When you put this tubing in and close the door, it automatically clamps this off for you. Right? So that happened automatically. So once I close the door, I can open this clamp, and it's still not going to be any flow because all the flow is controlled by the pump. And currently, the pump's turned off. Everybody with me? All right, let's program our pump. Now it's all ready to go. And we are so far beep free. <coughs> So we're going to turn our pump on, and I'm going to say new patient, yeah, med surge, yeah, and uh, if you, when it asks for a patient ID, you can put in the MR number. Is that what they do on PEDS? You put in the MR number or name? You're not doing it? Okay. 
Yeah. It's commonly not done, but there's nothing wrong with putting the MR in. You'll hear different ways. Okay, it's asking me new patient. I'm going to say yes. If I'm on a med surge floor, I'll just say yeah. Now it's asking for the patient ID. I can put in their MR number. One, two, three, four, five. Confirm. Now, it's got this A over here. Now, what people tend to do is hit this A over here on the big screen. Beep, beep. Beep, beep, and it, it, it's not giving you anything. If you want to work with the channel, select the channel. And you do that right there on the channel. It says channel select. And at the risk of it starting to beep at me, I don't think it will, but if it does. Um, one thing to remember when you're working with the pump is that it will usually prompt you with what to do on the screen. It will give you screen prompt. So if you find yourself a little stuck, read the screen. Like right now it says select channel. Okay. So I'm going to do channel select. Now at the bottom it says select an option or exit. My options are drug, fluid, or basic infusion, right? You guys have all seen that. And this is a fluid. This is a fluid. So I'm going to select fluid. Right there on the first page is normal saline. Yes. And then it's going to ask me, ask me to confirm that it's normal saline. Yes. Now it's going to ask for a rate. We're just going to, I'm going to run it slow. So I'll say 25. And then for volume, you can put like 975 so you have a little bit left. The priming volume for these is in the 20s, 25 milliliters. So the priming volume is 25 milliliters. So as long as you put in at least that much, um, you're not going to run your tubing drive for a, a replacement bag, right? Okay. So everything's quiet and running nicely. I have programmed a primary IV infusion, and it's running. Now, we have an order for uh, antibiotic. And we're going to run it as a secondary. Now, you will hear different terms to describe the same thing. Piggyback or secondary, what's a piggyback, what's a secondary? I can only tell you what I call them. I call a piggyback and a secondary two different things because it's just simpler that way, I think. Instead of calling, giving the same thing two different names. If it's a piggyback, the way I describe it, and my suggestion for you, um, that means you have a different bag, a different set of primary tubing, and a different channel and it plugs in down here at the Y site, which is six, eight inches up from the end of the tubing, okay? You guys know where I'm pointing down at the Y site, right? You can't. And that's the piggyback. Right. That's what I call a piggyback. So you cannot put it in a different channel, you've added a pump. No, it's a different channel on the same pump. It runs through its own channel, a piggyback. So you'll, I'll have another bag here. I'll have another set of primary tubing running through its own channel plugged in down here. And as long as I've uh, checked my compatibility, then I should be okay to run any piggyback in right there. Now a secondary comes in a little bag with the little short tubing. It comes with a little hangy thing for lowering one of your bags. You do have to know which bag goes lower. And you've got your short secondary tubing, okay? So now I see, in addition to my order for normal saline running on this patient, I have an order for uh, an antibiotic. I'm going to run it as a secondary because it runs over a short period of time. If it were a four-hour antibiotic that runs over four hours, I would run it as a piggyback through its own channel. Why would I do that? Right, so I'm not stopping my fluids for four hours. That's too long to stop your fluids. But if you can run it over, you know, and generally speaking, there's some judgment involved here. There's no, it's not black and white. But generally speaking, if it's an hour or so or less and you have a somewhat comparable rate and your patient has a stable fluid status, then you can run it as a secondary. All right, so I got my antibiotic and I've checked my order and all that good stuff. And this is actually just a little bag of fluid, but we'll pretend. If I can open it up. Yes, sir. Can I ask a quick question? When you chose uh, basic infusion, when you were up there choosing one of the three? I didn't choose basic infusion. I chose fluid. And I, I, it's, actually, it's actually running across the screen here, 